I've always said to folks that the success of Rainier Scholars lies in a combination of the committed scholars and families who trust us to walk alongside them in their journeys to college and beyond, but also in the remarkable staff who teach, guide, mentor, and inspire, committing the same excellence, perseverance, integrity, and courage, that's epic in Rainier Scholars speak, to the cause that we ask of our scholars. And so with that in mind, today we're gonna to do something a little different for those of you who are used to hearing me make some remarks. I actually want to give the chance for you to hear from one of those extraordinary teachers on our team, Mr. Drago Little. So, yep, already a star. <laughs> so many of you in this room have come to know our program through a tour of our academic enrichment phase, and in that experience have undoubtedly had a chance to sit on what I call Mr. Little's Socratic classroom. He's a literature writing teacher beyond compare, an expert in all things education, and he's often one of the key forces who awakens within our scholars that sense of possibility. He pulls no punches on the tremendous effort required to get to whatever beyond you have in mind for yourself. And he is the embodiment of what it looks like in our society when some of the best and brightest choose teaching as their vocation. So with great pride, I cede my time at the podium to Mr. Drago Little today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. For the last couple of years at Rainer Scholars, we have been doing homework about youth and child development and the kinds of things that would impede certain students from taking advantage of the opportunities our society has to offer. And there's one large takeaway that we have discovered in the literature, and that is that the way you describe a child pays a tremendous amount of importance to how they're going to be regarded and regard themselves in the world. So you will notice in your program today that the theme of what I'm going to say today is the road to downtown. The first six words that were used to describe me to my mom were, he is not going to make it. Now, there are a few reasons why they may have said that to my mom. One, I was three months premature. Two, two pounds, five ounces. Three, black. And four, born to a teenage mother in 1969. But I had a leg up. My mother is brilliant, as black moms tend to be. So, so, my earliest memory is of reading aloud to my mom. I was three years old and I could read. My mother, again, was a practical person, so she exposed me to the classics very young. Green eggs and ham. <laughs> One of the great documents of Western literature that is not arguable. So, this continued for two or three years before I started school. I did not realize that that, Dr. Seuss, and me would be a problem until I started school. The problem was my reading. I was good at it. And they did not know what to do with me. In the second grade, I read at a seventh or eighth grade level. Now, because I had not been practicing math until <laughs> At the age of three, my math was a little woogity. Their explanation for the difference was that I had to be retarded. This is what they told my mother. My mother, again, being the practical person that she is, she says, well, I'll tell you what. Since you obviously don't have to help him learn to read, you can allocate all that time to the math. <laughs> Problem solved. Neither she nor I understood that school didn't work that way, and the problem continued. This was the pattern from second grade to freshman year of high school. I would show up, I would read well, I would do half the homework, the reading half. They would come up with some wild explanation for why I couldn't count, and then write me off. At about the age of 14, I got tired 
and a little stubborn about treating as though I were unintelligent pretty much every year, so I left school. I do not recommend dropping out of high school as a path to college. We know it does not work. I am not proud of that fact, but this was the journey that I took. In my neighborhood, in the Central District, in the 1980s, the big question we used to ask each other was how do you get to downtown? From where we lived, all of the rainbows seemed to land downtown. All of the big meetings about what was gonna happen in our neighborhoods and to us and in our schools seemed to happen downtown. Now, the obvious answer from where I lived was, you get on the number two bus, take it down Union, get off at Seneca. That ain't what they meant. <laughs> what they really meant was, was how do, you, how do you get to the center of the life of the city, the centers of power, the centers of culture, the centers of art? How do you get to the places that determine what kind of city we are going to live in and what kind of society we are going to live in? Now, I am not in high school, but I am still reading. So for three years, I read a book a week. All of that ended, my independent study was wandering the city, when I was 19, where I met, in my estimation, the first real teacher I ever met. Her name was Mary Ellen Cardella, and she was an insane little Irish woman. And I say insane because, to her, college prep was for everyone. It was a re-entry program very similar to Rainer Scholars, but it was for high school kids who either did not flourish in regular comprehensive high schools or who had dropped out entirely. She taught the humanities class. I realized the kind of teacher she was the first time I pulled one of those all-nighters. You know, when you work on a paper, you've all been to undergrad, where you procrastinate, you procrastinate, you procrastinate, and then you try to do the reading and the writing between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m., <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like the academic Hail Mary. <laughs> so I hand the paper to her, and when she's handing back the papers, I read well, so I wrote, you know, fairly well, and she literally holds my paper like it's a dead fish. <laughs> and she says to me, as she's looking me right in the eye, if this is the level of effort I can expect from you, please go somewhere else. Because when you get to college, you're going to have to know how to do this. So stop being a joker and do your job. Part of that is the most revolutionary sentence that had ever been said to me up until that point. When you get to college. Not if, not maybe, not sort of, but when. She assumed that we were the kind of people who were going to go to college. And the reason why she was not playing with us is because she knew what we would have to be able to do. It was the first time I saw someone view making demands of underrepresented students as a sign of respect for them, and I've never forgotten that lesson. Fast forward about 10 years. I have been a youth worker in Seattle for about nine years at this point. I'm working in a summer program in South Seattle. There was a scheduling snafu, so the students we were supposed to meet with were all on a field trip, so we're sitting in a room all day out at Aki Karosi waiting for them to come back. And then a man named Robert Hurlbut walked in and said he wanted to start a place called Rainier Scholars, which would essentially operate like a dream factory for low-income students of color in South Seattle. You know the rest of the story. More importantly is that we try to see our students that we serve at Rainier Scholars as the kind of people who will be consequential and important to our lives. Not some nebulous definition of success where we 
have no connection to it. So you have to be able to imagine all of the kids you deal with, you see, you support, you think about as people who are going to be downtown with you. When you see one of our Filipino boys, do you see him as the person who will deliver your grandchildren? When you see one of our black American girls, will she be the US attorney who makes sure that the people who spill oil in your natural resources clean it up? When you see one of our Latinas, will she be the mayor who manages to get transit right <laughs> in Seattle? And when you see one of our black American boys, can you see him? Do you see him as the guy who gets your baby excited about calculus? Or Shakespeare, take your pick. The overall point is this. It is not a matter of knowing what to do. We know more about, a help, about how to help students succeed than we ever have before in history. We know that. It is a matter of will and follow through and making sure that we are seeing all of our students as part of our community. And I can assure you, with excellence, perseverance, integrity, and courage, victory is assured. One final point. One of my heroes is the librarian Nancy Pearl. Everyone knows Nancy Pearl. <laughs> Literature nerds don't have a lot of rock stars. Most of them are dead. She's one of the ones who is alive. I bump into Nancy at the university bookstore in the children's section. That's where we both hang out. She says she would like to talk to me on her show. Now, I thought she had a radio show. She said, no, 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 after I've already agreed a month later. She says, no, I'm going to interview on my TV show. And I'm like, oh, God. So I'm thinking I'm going to be in some basement at the UW with just she and I. She's like, no, we're meeting at the Women's University Club downtown. <laughs> Again, how do you get to downtown is a question that will not leave us, either intellectually, socially, or culturally. So I think it is one that we should begin thinking about. And I am very pleased to announce our next speaker, the Yentat Cohort 4, because she has also formulated an answer to this question. Thank you. <laughs>